continue our um, last sayings of Jesus series this week. Uh, we move to the Gospel of John where Jesus is talking to Mary and to the disciple he loved. Um, most people recognize this as John, but we don't know that for sure. But honestly, it's not really that important. Um, I, have, I have a job for you. I want you to think. I know, Sunday morning. How dare he make me think. I want you to think of something in the world today that is important and matters to you. Maybe something in the news uh, that you have an opinion on, that maybe you like to uh, post on social media, that you're pretty, pretty strong feeling about. Uh, now, there's no right or wrong answers, uh, and I'm honestly not even concerned about what the topic is. Okay, so don't, don't tell me about it or anything like that. I don't know what, want to know what the topic is for this particular situation. It could be an international event. It could be about what the elections are going to look like in November. Again, we're not going to discuss it, though. Um, but I want something that you feel especially passionate about, something that you are feeling really strong about. Maybe it's climate change or the health of our environment or, or the government. Everybody has feelings about that, right? Or, or gun violence, or racism, or discrimination. Um, I don't know what it is. Maybe it's, it's on the wars that are going on, or the, the way our, our country is moving. Maybe it's about uh, economic policy on health care. Um, maybe it's about the poor and the, the welfare recipients. Maybe it's about immigrants and the, the refugees. It might be about a more personal decision. Would be about marriage or your family. And let's be honest, <clears throat> when I ask you to only think of one thing, that's probably the hardest part, isn't it? Narrowing it down to one thing. If I say, I want you to tell me the one thing you're especially passionate about, how many of you could actually narrow it down to one thing? It's tough, isn't it? It really is tough. So I'm going to give you a second. I want you to think about it. Give it in your mind, the one thing. You don't have to worry about closing your eyes unless that helps. I don't care. Now, do you have it? You got that one thing? All right. So now, are you ready? Here's the next part of it. Did your worship on Sunday affect how you think about that? Did your worship on Sunday... Does your walk with Christ affect how you think about that particular situation? Is it relevant? In what ways do prayer, scripture reading, maybe the hymns we sing, the sermon you hear, <coughs> maybe even offering, how does that affect how you think about that subject? Does it affect it? I think it should. Right? I, I mean, not, not necessarily the whole church aspect, but the church part that helps open your eyes to what God wants. That should affect how you think about your life. What I'm really asking is whether Jesus, the gospel, the law, the prophets, how everything connects to your politics, your economics, your social values, and your personal decisions. Does it really make a difference? This is the, uh, this is the Holy Trinity of the United Methodist Church. That's a joke. You can laugh at that. Okay. Most of you know that the United Methodist Church has what's called the Book of Discipline. Okay? Now, the Book of Discipline is basically like our guidelines, kind of like our rules and stuff. Um, nobody actually sits down and reads this, though. Um, 
more often than not, we pastors will text each other and say, hey, where in the book of discipline does it talk about this? And then about five of us will get together and try to find it. Now, some of you may know that we have a book of worship. Okay? Now, the book of worship is filled with um, different service ideas, uh, hint <coughs> suggestions for particular Sundays, things like that. It, it, it actually can be very, very helpful. Um, you know, when I started doing funerals and stuff, I looked in here for examples of what does a funeral really look like? Because, I mean, a number of us have been to funerals, but can you actually tell me what the order of service looks like for a funeral? I've been to a lot of them. I had to pull this out to make sure I was doing it right. Now, here is the big one that I'm betting a lot of you have never even heard of. It's called the Book of Resolutions. Some of you may have heard of it. And you'll notice it's definitely the <coughs> isn't it? Well, what's interesting is the Book of Resolutions, I consider actually the most important of the three. And most people don't know it even exists. Because what this is, this is the social policies of the United Methodist Church. Deals with things like the natural world, how we deal with the world, how are we protecting the world we live in. It talks about economic ideas, about political ideas, not about who we should vote for or anything, but how we should present and talk about politics. But the most important piece, it talks about social justice. Now, according to the new Oxford American Dictionary, social justice is defined as Justice in terms of the distribution of wealth, opportunities, and privileges within a society. Aristotle, one of those really smart guys that died a long time ago, said, justice ensured that individuals both fulfilled their social idyllic roles and received what was their due from society. Over the years, these benefits and rights have come to include public education, access to health care, social security, the right to organize, and a broader spectrum of other public services. The French moralist Joseph Joubert said, justice is truth in action. John Wesley, the founder of the United Methodist Movement, said, do, uh, do you not know that God entrusted you with, with that money all above what buys necessities for your families. To feed the hungry, to clothe the naked, to help the stranger, the widow, the fatherless, and indeed, as far as it will go, to relieve the wants of all mankind. How can you, how dare you, defraud the Lord by applying it to any other purpose? I quoted a lot of smart people there. And for some of you, you may say, who cares? What's the Bible say? And that's actually not a bad response. Don't actually stand up and shout that at me, though. That would really freak me out. <laughs> but, but it really does make sense. There's a lot of smart people that talk all about social justice. But what does the Bible, what does Jesus say? What does God say about social justice? Now, I will tell you, the term social justice does not exist in Scripture. Right off the bat, I will tell you that. I will tell you, though, you've already heard two scriptures this morning that talk about social justice. It's a call for social justice. Remember, taking care of the downtrodden of society that's prevalent throughout scripture from the very beginning. It was talking about taking care of those who are down on their luck, who are at the bottom of the barrel, those who are struggling with the times that they are living in. From Moses to Jesus, we are called to social justice, to taking care of others. Luke 4, 18-19, the Spirit of the Lord is on me because he has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. 
He has sent me to proclaim freedom for the prisoners and recovery of sight for the blind, to set the oppressed free, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. That's Jesus talking. You want to go back to the Old Testament? I got that too. Jeremiah 22, 3. This is what the Lord says. Do what is just and right. Rescue from the hand of the oppressor the one who has been robbed. Do no wrong or violence to the foreigner, the fatherless, or the widow, and do not shed innocent blood in this place. Well, what about after Jesus left? That, we kind of got rid of it after that, right? Acts 6, 1 through 7 says that when the Greek-speaking widows were not being cared for, as well as the Hebrew and Aramaic-speaking widows, a new system was put in place. The disciples were charged with doing that. Do you realize? It's all through Scripture. And something really interesting I found, and you would think as a pastor who reads Scripture, I, I would have picked up on this sooner. But did you realize the only miracle Jesus performed in all the Gospels is feeding people? Do you realize that? We have four phenomenal Gospels. And one miracle that Jesus performed in all four. Jesus didn't ask them if they could afford to buy food. He didn't teach them to fish or offer them tough love. Jesus saw people in need and helped them. Now, some people say, that's awful dangerously close to socialism. It's the gospel. I'm not preaching socialism. I'm preaching the gospel. If you want to say it's socialism, well, then maybe it's socialism. But socialism is the gospel, then, apparently. That's what I'm preaching here, is the gospel. I'm not preaching socialism. Now, you may be wondering, what the heck does this have to do with Jesus being on the cross and talking to his, his mother and this, this guy down here? Jesus was actually following with an ancient Jewish tradition of making sure that the widows, his mother, was taken care of. Remember that scripture that we heard from Zechariah? He talked about taking care of the widows and the orphans. I think Jesus was most definitely following through with the ancient Jewish tradition. I think he loved his mother and wanted to make sure that she was taken care of. But I also think he might have been saying, hey, remember this whole idea I've been talking about over and over and over again? This is what I'm talking about. <laughs> Taking care of each other. Not necessarily because they deserve it. Not necessarily because they earned it. But because I have done it first. I want you to copy me. There is no restrictions on God's love. There is no prerequisite for us serving others. Now, is there responsibilities if you want to die and go to heaven? Yes, there is. But that's on the individual person. Your job is to love them all. My job is to love them all. Even the unlovable. It's to serve the people that we don't like. Yeah, that happens. It's to serve everybody out there, whether or not they've earned it. It's not about earning. It's about, did God call you to do it? Well, yeah, then do it. That's what we're supposed to do. I know it's a struggle. It's tough sometimes. Because we, we look at where we're at and say, we worked really hard to get where we're at. Why should they get off scot-free? It's not our job to judge. It's not our job to say, well, you need to do this first. Jesus never did it, so why should we? Jesus never said, you got a couple of hoops to jump through first. He said, I'm going to serve you. Because I guarantee you, those 5,000 people that served, that Jesus gave food to, you think every one of them came to salvation? No. 
I don't think so. Did that stop Jesus from serving them? It did. That's the thing. Can you imagine? And Jesus knew that. He knew exactly which ones were going to come to salvation. And he served them anyway. He never said to the disciples, okay, so that row gets fish and bread. That next row, skip them. He said, serve them all. Serve them all. And again, it's like, where's our benefit? Our benefit is serving God. That's our benefit. That's what we earn. A desire to serve God. And that desire will build up more and more. Jesus was reminding people as he was on the cross that we have to care for each other. Even the ones that maybe don't deserve it. And isn't that tough? Isn't that tough? It is. It is. It's so tough. Because I'll tell you the truth. I can be pretty dumb on sin. When people put on, on Facebook or things like that, they're looking for donations. I'm like, I'm, I'm sorry, and I shouldn't be like that, but sometimes I'm like, yeah, but what do they really want? What are they really after? It doesn't mean we shouldn't be protective of ourselves. But let's kind of maybe put the cynicism aside a little bit. Serve where we're called to serve. Go where we're called even if it doesn't make sense, even if it might be a struggle, even if those people are there, wherever those people may be. You know, I've, I've served uh, in, and helped with, with food pantries and, and um, things like that before. And let's be honest, there are people that take advantage of it in there. <coughs> I, I, we can all agree with that. It happens. People take advantage of it. Does that mean we should stop it? Absolutely not. Because maybe there's one or two that are taking advantage of it, but what about number three and number four who really, really need it? It's, it's our job to serve. It's our job to serve. Christ was on the cross in excruciating pain. And what was he wanting? People to love each other. To serve each other. That's what he was wanting. And if we have, if we have to spend a few extra bucks ourselves, isn't that worth it? I think it is. So think about this. Who are the widows around you? Who are the orphans around you? Who are the downtrodden around you? I'm not saying whether or not they deserve it. I'm asking, do they exist around you? Then there's your, there's your mission field. I don't know what it's going to look like for each one of us. We all have a different mission field. But we're all called to serve. If you would, let's bow together. Lord God, it's tough, God. It's really tough sometimes to serve when maybe we don't want to. To serve sometimes when it doesn't make sense. To serve when maybe just maybe something may be taken from us. Whether it's our, our comfort level, whether it's finances, whatever it may be, we need to serve you. To serve you completely and without holding anything back. We pray, Lord, that our hearts and minds can be open to this so we can be your true and complete servants. In Jesus' name, amen.